I believe in the man in the sky. His name is Jesus. I believe with his help I'll get by. For my footsteps, they may falter. My eyes may grow dim. He's my Gibraltar. I'm trusting in him. Though the sparrow is all. singing his praise till the end of the days I believe in the man in the sky and his name is Jesus I believe in the man in the sky I believe with his help I'll get by but my footsteps they may falter my eyes may grow dim He's my Gibraltar I'm trusting in him Though a sparrow is all I may be I me He will still keep an eye Keep an eye Singing his praise Till the end of my days I believe in the man, Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. Welcome to Gates Baptist Church. <clears throat> We'd like to start out just by reading Psalm 24. So if you'd join me, you can read along in your Bible. Psalm 24, a psalm of David. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord's, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and let the King of glory, he shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty, the Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Salah. So let's pray. Lord, in these troubled times, we just think of you. We think that you are above all things. You're above this world. Matter of fact, you look down from the highest heavens upon all the things you've created. You look down, and in the very beginning you said it was good. It was even very good. And Lord, we know that in these times that there are evil forces at work. There's sickness. There's pain. There's lots of uncertainty, Lord. There's fear. But we know that you are above all these things, and that you offer comfort. You offer hope. You offer salvation to those who put their trust in you. And not just that, Lord, you offer us the chance to have righteousness and be righteous, but only because of what Jesus has done. And I pray that we would just fellowship together today, that even though we're spread out among the country, among the city, Lord, I pray that as we take some time and just think about your word, that we'll be thankful for what you've done, that we'll put our hope, our trust in you. Lord, most of all, we thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Mike. I just want to share a few brief announcements this morning. Uh, we understand Katie Klosbach has purchased some palm branches, and they will be available for everybody who would like some. You can pick them up this afternoon or tomorrow 
and that will be on the south side of the church over here, the double white doors. So please keep that in mind uh, as today, or I should say tomorrow, is Palm Sunday. And so we bring that to your attention. Also, the April newsletter, we're very thankful for Lynn Wilson's help composing that and putting it together. That is now available on the web page, and so you're more than welcome to, to tune into that and read on that. And so we're very grateful for that information. Also, we're excited to announce that God has blessed Sam and Genoa Atwater with a baby boy. And uh, his name is Stanley James, and I understand he was born Friday, March 27th. And so we rejoice with Sam and Genoa in this little boy. So keep them in your prayers. And uh, it's just so exciting to think that we have at least three more expectant mothers right now on our church list. Uh, but we're glad for little Stanley James. So we bring that to your attention today. At this time in our service, we have a short video to show, which will prepare the way for the morning message. So listen carefully. I've been caught outright and dragged straight into open daylight. Bystanders gawking, the village women absorbing every morsel of gossip, Common decency dictated that the shame of the moment was enough. But the law called for something greater. My life. Of course, a long audience followed behind. Don't think I didn't recognize a couple of them. Their words condemned me, but they didn't dare look me in the eye. I did everything to try to cover my shame, but I couldn't hide from the onlookers or this holy man whose feet they threw me to. I was finished. I stared at the ground when he said that whoever was sinless, they should go first. They should throw the first stone. squeezed my eyes shut, grasping at the gravel, waiting for the end of my life to unfold. Nothing, though. Then footsteps, except they were walking away. I looked up. Is there no one left to accuse you, he asked me. No, I don't either. He said, go and sin no more. Accusers. That's how he ended up on the cross. And as he hung there dying, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it, it is finished. That's something different. That's a different thing. It means that something is accomplished, restored. He restored my hope, my self-respect and my dignity. I didn't even know I had any left. <laughs> On a day when I thought that my life was finished, the only man there holy enough to demand justice handed me mercy. What a testimony, amen. Before we get into the actual text this morning and, and what I'd like to share with you, why don't we pray? Father, we ask in these precious moments, these solemn moments before you, that you would come and quiet and soften our hearts. And thank you 
for your grace. Thank you for your enduring mercies. Jeremiah reminded us that it's because of your mercies we are not consumed. We're so very thankful, Father, that your companions, they fail not. They are new. Every morning, great is thy faithfulness. Thank you for this video testimony we've just heard. And as you worked in the life of that adulterous woman, we're thankful that you worked in another life, a man's life that hung on a cross. Open our eyes to the truth. And for those that can listen, whether it be on a computer, whether it be on a DVD, we pray that you might use it and bless it. And may those who listen tell others. And may the message spread to others that Jesus saves. That in spite of our sinful past and stain-filled life, that you're able to clean the slate and to give us new abundant life, eternal life with you in heaven. Thank you for these moments to share together. Father, how we continue to pray for those that are afflicted, maybe directly with this virus, those who have been diagnosed with it, those that may be potentially diagnosed with it, those that are living in fear, those that may be living in tremendous anxiety, we pray that you'd quiet and calm their hearts. Father, help people see that without Jesus, there ultimately is no real hope, but because Jesus is alive and well, not only for what he did on the cross, but what he did in his amazing resurrection, we're thankful that we have a living hope in him. May many, Multitudes of people all over the world call on Jesus. We thank you for these moments together. Help the Chiswicks in their hour of need and decision making. Thy will be done. There's concern in some circles. There's gladness in others as we think of how you've blessed Sam and Genoa with little Stanley James. In the midst of all this uncertainty, what joy and gladness a new life brings. And we're so thankful for how you've blessed that young family and will. Thank you, Father, for this ministry. Help us to be that salt, that light that you would want us to be in these turbulent times. Help us to realize the Bible's very, very clear about the end times, the last days. They'll be perilous. And every time we listen to the news and check out the newspaper, it seems like, Lord, it's just a repetition of what the Bible has said so long ago. Indeed, the Bible is tomorrow's edition. Thank you for what you've given. And we pray as Scripture is read and opened up, that, Lord, hearts would be, would be ready and open and receptive to what you have to say. So, Lord, thank you for this fellowship that we can have on this level. And we pray, God, that if it be your will, you would bring as speedy an end to this virus as possible. And so we give it to you, and we certainly Immerse in prayer those in medical circles that are just so busy round the clock tending to the great need locally and all around us, around the world. Give them strength and wisdom and much grace in these trying times. How we thank you for Christian doctors, Christian nurses, Christian EMTs, Christian firemen. Christian policemen who can share hope in Christ about the divine healer. Thank you for your love now. We pray you'll move in a mighty way during these next few moments. For Jesus' sake, amen. Before I read the actual text of Scripture this morning, I want to share a couple anecdotes with you. Uh, one is 
from Robert Morgan's book here entitled Real Stories for the Soul. Tomorrow is Palm Sunday according to our calendar. I thought these would be good to share in light of the fact that Jesus really is Messiah. He's the Christ. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He was a has-been, a fossil, a relic, an old fogey, but it hadn't always been so. As a child, George Frederick Handel had, accomp had accompanied his father to the court of Duke Johann Adolf. Idly wandering into the chapel, the boy found the organ and started improvising, causing Duke Adolf to exclaim, Who is this remarkable child? This remarkable child soon began composing operas, first in Italy, and then in London. By his 20s, he was the talk of England and the best paid composer on earth. He opened the Royal Academy of Music, and the next several years were intoxicating. Londoners fought for seats at his every performance, and his fame soared around the world. But the glory passed. Audiences dwindled. His music became outdated. The academy went bankrupt, and newer artists eclipsed the aging composer. One project after another failed, and Handel grew depressed. The stress brought on a case of palsy that crippled some of his fingers. Handel's great days are over, wrote Frederick the Great. His inspiration is exhausted. Yes, his troubles also matured him, softening his sharp tongue. His temper mellowed. His music became more heartfelt. One morning, Handel received by post a script from Charles Jennings. It was a word-for-word -word collection of various biblical texts about Christ. The opening words from Isaiah 40 moved Handel, Comfort ye, my people. On August 22, 1741, he shut the door of his London home and started composing music for the words. Twenty-three days later, the world had Messiah. Whether I was in the body or out of the body when I wrote it, I know not, Handel later said, trying to describe the experience. Messiah opened in London to enormous crowds on March 23, 1743. Handel led from his harpsichord, and King George II, who was present that night, surprised everyone by leaping to his feet during the Hallelujah Chorus. No one knows why. Some believe the king, being hard of hearing, thought it the national anthem. No matter, from that day, audiences everywhere have stood in reverence during the stirring words, Hallelujah, for he shall reign forever and ever. I was also looking over a book entitled Love is the Answer by Robert V. Osment. Some of you might remember, if any of you have studied a little bit of church history, that one of the early church fathers who came off the early disciples, there was a gentleman named Polycarp. It's believed he was a disciple of the Apostle John. But Polycarp, a first century Christian, expressed this belief following in his footsteps when men were being fed to the lions and burned at the stake for their faith. He was arrested and asked to denounce Christ. The Roman officer who arrested Polycarp tried to persuade him to say, Lord Caesar. Polycarp said, I am a Christian. Just pay your respect to Caesar and save your life, the proconsul urged. Reproach Christ and you'll be free. Polycarp said, Eighty and six years 
have I served him, and he never did me an injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? He was led to the stake and burned alive. Never once did he flinch from the pain. Wow, powerful stories and messages and men and women of history who stood firm in their faith. This morning's text is found in Luke 23. In your Bibles, I'd encourage you to grab a Bible if you have one there. Luke 23, beginning with verse 39. And before I read the actual text... I just want to share an interesting statement by Max Lucado. I had a book on my shelf entitled by Max, Six Hours, One Friday. I believe it's very appropriate. I really appreciate Max Lucado. I've read a number of his books. I find him to be a very, very creative writer, a style that's very easy to read, getting the truth across. Uh, I'm thankful for his writing ministry. But he said these words, and I quote, Nicodemus came in the middle of the night. The centurion came in the middle of the day. The leper and the sinful woman appeared in the middle of crowds. Zacchaeus appeared in the middle of a tree. Matthew had a party for him. And now... One more beggar comes with a request. Only minutes from the death of them both, he stands before the king. He will ask for crumbs, and he, like the others, will receive a whole loaf. Max Lucado, six hours, one Friday. Let's look at Luke 23, verses 39 to 43 this morning. We read in the context, and some of the other gospel writers mention that there was a thief crucified on either side of Jesus. And the other two, Matthew and Mark, mention that both thieves were reviling Christ, railing at him, mocking him. In fact, the word here is that they were just filled with blasphemy regarding Jesus in the center. However, when we come to the Gospel account of Luke, we find that one of the two thieves, according to the biblical record, had a, had a change of heart. Look at me with Luke 23, 39. The Bible says one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other, but the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Luke 23, 39 to 43. I've I've entitled this message this morning, A Plea for Mercy. Indeed, what a plea for mercy it was. Several things I want to share with you this morning about this dying man on the cross. This is one of my favorite scenes of Calvary, one that touches me deeply. But I want you to notice, first of all, a dying man's attitude of repentance. Repentance. What is repentance? Well, 
we believe the Bible talks a lot about repentance. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We believe repentance is necessary if anyone is going to be saved from their sin. And it means to have a change of mind and thinking, a change of heart, a change of direction in how we view sin and what sin can do. While one thief reviled Christ, the other had a genuine change of heart and thinking. What must have happened? What caused such change? Could it be the impact of Jesus' prayer for forgiveness? I believe so. Verse 34 of Luke 23, Jesus, the very first words that came out of His mouth on the cross as He hung there was in the form of a prayer. And I find as there are seven sayings of Christ on the cross, prayer forms the bookends of while He was on that cross. About a six-hour period of time indeed, from nine in the morning till about three in the afternoon. But as Jesus hung there, one of the, the, the message that came from his lips was in the form of a prayer, very simply put, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I would share with you today that ignorance is not innocence. That's important to keep in mind here. But while one thief was reviling him, the other thief, had a whole change of thinking. In fact, he really defended the Savior. He spoke up for Him. You remember in Acts chapter 7 in your Bibles when Stephen, one of the early deacons of the church, was stoned for his faith? The Bible tells us that he said, Lord, And he had a prayer as he was being put to death by stoning for his faith. He prayed, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. The Bible tells us, standing there that day was a young man named Saul. As he must have heard Stephen pray for the forgiveness of his enemies, it must have really touched Saul. In fact, that sense of conviction went with him for a period of time because in Acts 9, as he was on his way to Damascus to slay believers and haul them off into prison, he asked a very simple question. Lord, what would you have me do? He didn't say Jesus. When he first had the vision, he says, who are you? The Bible says, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you, Saul, to kick against the pricks. <laughs> it's almost as if Jesus was saying to Saul, I've been working on you. You've been under conviction. And you've been uneasy and restless. It's been difficult for you to keep kicking against the goads, the pricks. Finally, he utters, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have me to do? The dying thief who repented said to the other thief, Don't you fear God? Don't you fear God? We're getting what we deserve. We've broken the law. We've defied God. We're dying the death we deserve. But this man, this man, has done nothing amiss, nothing out of place. He's innocent. We're receiving justice for the evil deeds that we have done. But this man is innocent. He doesn't deserve this kind of excruciating death. Well, he came out with this very blunt rebuke for the other thief. And so we see, first, the dying man's attitude of repentance. Secondly, we notice a dying man's request. A dying man's request for mercy, according to verse 42. 
The Bible says he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That word Lord stands out to me. It doesn't say he said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me. He said, Lord, you're the anointed one. You are Messiah. You are Lord. You are Lord. And that's exactly what Saul addressed Jesus as in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6. Lord, what would you have me to do? The Bible tells us no one can ascribe lordship to Jesus but by the Holy Spirit. These are important things to remember. This dying thief knew that Jesus would be more than just a memory. This wouldn't be just a simple memorial and a memory of one who died and stood for certain things. He'd viewed it more than just a martyr's death. He realized life would go on for this man. And someday he would come into his kingdom and his request was simple for mercy. Lord, remember me. Be thinking of me. But I want you to notice that he was addressing also here the coming king. The coming king, not only of all creation, but king of kings and lord of lords. I just want to take a moment and share with you what the book of the Revelation says about this Jesus. Someday, not only is Jesus coming again for his bride, the church, but he's also going to come to the earth as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in Revelation 19, verse 11, the Apostle John writes, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations." And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We not only see this man's attitude of repentance at the cross, we not only see his request and plea for mercy, but finally we notice the crucified king's response. The crucified king's response in verse 43. If you check that out in your Bible in Luke chapter 23, Jesus gave him a very simple response. Jesus said to this dying thief, Verily I say unto you, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Hmm. Today. You're not going to have to wait for some day way down in the future and wait and wait and wait and wait. I've got good news for you. We're going to be together today and have amazing fellowship in a place that is most beautiful, a garden. Jesus granted to him more than he asked for. Oh, the wonder of prayer. It makes me think of prayer here. He had a request. I'm so thankful that the Lord Jesus not only hears prayer, but answers it. In fact, when we ask for certain things. There are moments when he asks, gives us more than we could ever ask for or dream. 
I love Ephesians 3.20 where the Apostle Paul wrote, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20 Take heart, believer. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, not to give up or lose heart. Luke 18.1 Pray without ceasing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I saw this little statement in the middle margin of my Schofield Reference Bible, and I thought it quite appropriate. Listen to these words. One thief was saved that none need despair, but only one that none should presume. That's quite a wise statement there. I put on the guide sheet this morning and how true it is. This was a, indeed a deathbed conversion, if we'd like to call it that, but a deathbed conversion is better than no conversion at all. Better to be saved at the last minute than not to be saved at all. Where will we spend eternity? With Christ in paradise? Or will we spend eternity forever separated from Christ in hell? I remember years back at the homestead where I grew up, a lady came in who was very sad, a neighbor lady. She said her husband was not only sick and ill at the VA hospital in Canandaigua, but she made comment that he was dying. He was terminally ill. And she was very sad for her husband. And finally, it just seemed the Holy Spirit was putting it on my heart to go see him. And I asked his wife, I said, do you think your husband would like a visit? She says, oh, I know he would. So I went to Canandaigua and visited with that man. This was soon after my own dad passed away. Seems the timing was just, just right. In visiting with this man at the VA hospital, I began to tell about my dad, that I lost my father. He says, well, it must be pretty gloomy around the house now that your dad is gone. I made the comment to him, yeah, we are sad that Dad isn't with us right now, but we're also very glad that he's home in heaven right now. That gives us joy. We aren't concentrating on our loss. We're concentrating on his gain, his eternal gain. And then that opened up the way to share the gospel, the plan of salvation with this man. And after I shared the good news of Jesus with him, I said, don't you feel that you need to personally receive Christ as your Savior today? He says, I believe that's what I need to do. I prayed with him. I prayed and then he repeated words after me. And that man that day became a new man in Christ. At the time, I was pastoring Milan Baptist Church in Locke, New York. And I found out after we had returned home that eight days after I visited with him, he slipped into eternity. I was so thankful for his salvation. Thankful that God could use even me to point him to Christ. But what an experience that was that I will never forget. I want to share this story by Dr. Ironside that ties in very nicely with our text this morning. During a series of meetings years ago, <clears throat> an evangelist saw a young man who looked somewhat concerned. The evangelist went to him and asked if he were ready to die. And the lad replied, no, I am not ready. I hope to come someday. Remember the dying thief? 
The evangelist asked, which thief? The young man looked up startled. And he said, oh, I had forgotten. There were two, weren't there? Yes, replied the evangelist. And one went out, so far as we have any record, into eternity, closing his heart to the Savior and was lost forever. The other trusted him and was saved forever. Which thief are you going to be like? The young man said, I'd better come now. (laughs) And he closed with Christ that evening. Think of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to a dying thief. And remember that salvation is for you if you will fully trust Him. Before I close in prayer, we have a series of brief videos. As this is Holy Week, we know on our calendar that we're coming towards Maundy Thursday, the night of the Passover and Lord's Supper. We're coming to Good Friday, and this gives us some, some good visual reminder of what a precious week this is for reflection, for being quiet, for meditating on Scripture, and especially being thankful for all He's done for us. So at this time, we'll show these videos. It was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Um, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me, and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. (laughs) I looked at him. I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. You know who broke the silence? Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch, okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was a a new covenant with his blood. And he said, "Um, tonight... All of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. He said, Peter, you'll deny me three times before tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, And I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, 
That's the one you want. Now, 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek. That's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter... <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him. but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, and that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd, and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute, I, I am a man marked for death. And then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive 
it should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, It is finished. And then he died. Surely, this man was the son of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these tools that we can use to remind us of what the Bible says and what happened so long ago on Calvary's Hill. Father, may the message of the Gospel, the message of the truth, really get across to many. We think of many churches that are doing as we're doing, giving sermons on a church web page, countless churches, many pastors getting out the gospel of truth. We pray for a rich, abundant harvest of souls. And Lord, I pray that in the midst of all this craziness with the virus and the uncertainty, sometimes the, the way things change so, that, Lord, you would also bring a precious reviving to your church. And, Lord, that we'd be drawn ever so much closer to you, so much closer to one another in the body of Christ. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we especially thank you for Jesus Christ, head of the church, Lord of all, King of kings, Lord of lords, the only potentate, the Bible says. We're thankful to know Him and to worship Him and to be thankful to Him. Grant us the grace and the boldness needed to tell others the truth, to share the good news with those who've lost hope, And Lord, that many would see that Jesus is the answer. May they come to Him without delay. We thank You for the promise of Your return. And we pray that we'd be found ready, that we'd be occupied doing our Master's will. Thank You so much, Lord, for the truth of Your Word, for the power of prayer, and these very gentle, touching reminders of what a precious week this will be on our calendar as we meditate on Jesus' life, His journey to Calvary. We're thankful, Lord, that not only did Jesus die for our sins upon the cross and was buried as the Bible said He would be, but He rose again and is coming again in great power and glory. Oh, may many step into the ark of safety while there's still time, while the door is still open before it slams shut. Thank you for meeting with us this day and continue to bless our church family here at YBC. Protect all your people. And Lord, we pray the day will come soon when we'll be able to meet together again in this precious place. In Jesus' name, amen.